the complete redesign of my 350Z's interior and technology is going, dare I say, very well. But there's something that I still don't like. And it's these three gauges. Because now that I've modernized all of this and shifted it and created a full inlaid new fancy head unit, and you know, that's all stock, but these just feel a bit underperforming and that they're not really as useful as they could be. If you're not aware of what we've got here in the, in the 350Z, you've got your battery voltage, your oil pressure, and like this multifunction display. So at the moment it's showing temperature because it's icy outside. So it flicks over to that. But usually I press on, you press on these buttons here and you can cycle through a few things. So miles to empty, uh, MPGs, just a bunch of like stuff. Um, a clock which you literally cannot set because in order to set the clock you need to have an OEM stereo and uh, I can't do that so the only way to set the clock is to unplug the battery at just before 1 uh, p.m. when it is the time it resets to and then plug it back in bang on one um, but I always have this on speed because I personally feel that that speed over there isn't in the right spot for me to ever look at. I never look at that dial. I think these could give me a lot more useful and relevant information than they are currently doing. Fortunately, whilst I was deciding what to do with these gauges, I got an email from AliExpress, who is who I buy all of my electrical screens and components and things from anyway. And they said to me, hey, we love what you're doing. Do you have any cool projects coming up? that we can support you on. And I told them about this and they said, yeah, that sounds wicked. Let us send you what you need. So I told them what I needed and they sent me these. In these three boxes, I got three of the same thing. And it's these WaveShare ESP32 S3 powered 2.1 inch touchscreen module component things. These are really really cool not only do they have these great big screens that we're going to be able to put loads of information on but they've also got just like tons of stuff going on obviously in here we've got all of the cables and the ribbon cables and everything that we need to connect it up to whatever external inputs we're going to want to use but yeah we've got like i said it's powered by an esp32 s3 um, we've got things like the extension modules. We can put in an external memory card, which would be really useful if we actually want to capture live information and then be able to relay that back out and we want a larger amount of memory space. Both USB and UART inputs. Uh, generally, you're going to probably, probably use the UART just to make sure you can get the serial connection. Plus then a bunch of different outputs, your reboot buttons. You're like... These things are really robust and really well built. And for the project we're going to do, having three of these like alongside of one another, I think that the final result is going to be phenomenal. So I'm really excited to get start building on these. Now I have spent the last few days working with this board, trying to get it up and running in the way that I want. And there are a couple of difficulties. It comes with a bunch of code to show you how to work on it using uh, ESP IDF, but I don't want to use ESP IDF. I prefer to use a Platformio setup. So I've been trying to convert the code from ESP IDF to Platformio so that I can use my preferred standard and it's just not working. Um, I think it's something to do with the pin connectors and the fact that this board uses this extension chip, which takes one of the inputs, which I believe at this point to be pin zero, and then splits that out into eight different inputs so that when we're defining all of our inputs here, um, yeah, these come in through the extension and it doesn't quite understand where the inputs are supposed to be coming from. So it's it's not up and running currently with Platformio. And I've investigated a few forums and Git repos where people have been talking about this problem. And as far as I can tell, no one's figured it out yet. So that's going to be fun. 
trying to uh, figure that out. But when you run it with the ESP IDF, or they do also supply Arduino code, if you just wanted to run it in the Arduino IDE, we can get stuff up and running pretty easily. So here's an example that I've put on here. Just upload, there we go. So this is all working with the touch screen. We've got a little buzzer. Um, and yeah, as we can see, it, it's showing various values that it's grabbing. So there's no memory card in there, but we've got a flash size of 16. The angular deflection is cool because this actually has a gyroscopic sensor built into it. So if you wanted to do something with that, that could be really cool. I can imagine like almost a altitude thing like you would get in an airplane. So when you're going up and down hills, you show the altitude change. That would be really cool in order to be able to do that. Um, plus this obviously has the stuff that you would expect like a good ESP setup to have. There is wireless built into the ESP chip, plus we have Bluetooth. So we're gonna get this to be able to communicate really fantastically with all of our other devices that we're going to be using to actually send the information to these three screens. Aside from this, I also have this little thing, which I'm sure a number of you are going to instantly recognize, but this is a Neo 6M. And this is a GPS chip, which is going to allow me to extract really accurate GPS information. And it comes with a little aerial that just, you know, clicks onto there. If I can do it, pull it. come on, on you go. Come on, on you go. Come on, there we go. Yeah. No. Okay, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> this is a, a GPS chip. We can use this for doing some really interesting stuff. Like the Speedo in the 350Z is notorious for being inaccurate. So it might be better if we got the speed from the GPS sensor instead of doing it from the wheels, which means if the tire size changes, which it does when you are swapping out for drift wheels and whatnot, your speed is actually probably going to be more accurate. Now we probably do want a fallback that allows us to switch between a GPS value and the input that's coming through like the canvas reading. But we can think about all of that when we design how we uh, show the information on the screen. Also, I think it'd be really cool to be able to get the maximum speed of the road that we're on and display that. And we should be able to do that using GPS data with the Google API. If you have a 350Z or a similar car and you want to follow this project along and integrate the same things that I'm doing, you can go and grab yourself some of these screens and the GPS module from AliExpress. Uh, there are links in the description below. And now's a really good time because I'm launching this video actually as Black Friday starts and they've got some wicked deals going on. So you should be able to get them a lot cheaper as they're doing up to 80% off across the store. And uh, yeah, I'm actually about to pull the trigger on buying a bunch more components that I need. So ideal time to do it. But very specifically, if you do have a 350Z and you want to do this and you think, oh, I'll go, go get those 2.1 inch screens. Before you do, you need to consider this. So yeah, unfortunately with these, there's a problem. And it's totally my fault. See, when I measured the space that I have here, it came to about 54 millimeters. So I concluded that a 2.1 inch screen, because all these screens are done in Imperial, would be about bang on, and it'd be a millimeter or two around the outside edge, which I could cover with this ring. So that's what I asked them for, some 2.1 inch screens. But a 2.1 inch screen means the usable area is 2.1 inches. But when it's a touch screen like this, there's an additional, I'd say one centimeter all around the outside edge that houses all the stuff to make the touch work. So these aren't like 54 millimeters wide. These are 66 millimeters wide, which means they're not gonna fit. They're just too big. <laughs> yeah, learn a lesson from me. Read the spec sheet rather than just trusting that you know what you're doing because the spec sheet literally on the on the page where you buy them says that with the touch it's 66 millimeters so it's totally on me and now i need to buy some smaller ones so i need some 1.85 inch ones 
which will actually fit perfectly because they're like 56 millimeters wide. In the meantime, we can do all of the design and actually start the coding because it's going to be very transferable. The only difference is going to be the screen resolution and the screen size. So this one's a 480 by 480, whereas the new one will be a 360 by 360. Um, that's the only difference. So as long as I make sure all of the sizes that I create for things are relative to the height and width as opposed to being statically created, I should just be able to change the resolution values and everything will work fine. And also fortunately, we have a bunch of stuff to do in the meantime, so I can wait a week whilst new screens arrive because we've still got to do all the design and actually figure out what information is going to go on these screens, how it's going to look, how it's going to be orientated, etc. Also, I have to figure out how to repurpose these buttons on the side that currently change that one screen. I know that they're just simple five volt momentary switches, so I can actually just reuse those buttons to do all the control of the screens. So maybe I actually don't need touch screens after all, and I can just use LCDs. But we'll figure that out in the next step. Like I said, this is going to be a many part series. I don't know how many yet, but like each one of these gauge screens is going to be an individual video because it has inputs that come from many sources and there's going to be a lot going on in each one. Plus, we've got to think about the 3D mounting, powering requirements, custom PCBs. There's like loads and loads of stuff for this project. So if you're into big overarching projects that use many, many different interesting things, this is going to be a great series. So make sure you hit subscribe if you want to follow along with what we're doing. But in part two, the next piece, we're going to look at what information we have available to us. What can we pull out of the canvas? What like sensors and things already exist that we can pull information from? And what can we actually physically display on these screens? Then we'll do a cursory design using a prototyping tool that makes the information look really good, but also feels consistent with everything that's going on here in the 350Z. Because I don't want these to suddenly stand out and be garish. I want it to feel cohesive. So part two is going to be coming in the next few days as we get into that. So if you want to keep updated, make sure you hit the bell icon and then you'll be notified as and when that video comes out. Otherwise, whatever you do with the rest of your day, folks, have a wicked one and I'll see you in the next video. Take it easy, peeps. Bye-bye.